podcast. I was uh, going through and saw a podcast, and it was the head coach for the Saginaw Spirit, Chris Lazari. And um, so I saw, I'll listen to this one. So it was, uh, the, I think the podcast name was Off the Glass and Out, I think. Um, yeah. So there's my there's my reference point there, guys. <laughs> so if you want to f- li- listen to it, that's that's what's called Off the Glass and Out with Chris Lazari was the guest and Chris is the head coach of the Saginaw spirit. The reason I probably listen to it is because I have a pretty good connection with the Saginaw spirit having a couple of the players playing there. And I'm really good friends with the assistant GM and I met the, uh, the, the general manager and, you know, sent a couple of players there and I'm very interested in them and uh, they have a different style of playing. Right. So uh, they were talking about, uh, Chris was talking about, uh, you know, the guy was asking questions about, you know, where your start was and stuff. So most people, he didn't have, he didn't, he wasn't a high end hockey player. Played a little bit of junior B, nothing crazy, or tier two, nothing crazy. And then he wanted to get into coaching. So he got into coaching and he was broke, as, like broke, broke. So he didn't get to move up the ladder real real quick. But what this guy did was uh, he lived in Toronto, I think. He was coaching the, got to the point where he was coaching the Toronto Marlies, minor hockey. And he got an assistant coach or a coaching job with uh, doing video for the Guelph Junior B or Guelph Storm or something like that. And then he just kept working his way up. To the point where he got, uh, and but he said this was all because of connections. He goes, I would just, I dedicated. I said, I want to be a hockey coach, and he dedicated his like everything, video and taking buses, like broke. I mean, this guy was broke, and just traveling around coaching hockey teams and stuff. So finally, he got a job with the uh, was it Kitchener, Listowel? I forget what team it was in Junior B, and they ended up winning the Ontario uh, Junior B thing, and uh, and then he got fired. <laughs> They did. They were going the right, different direction. He took it with uh, the youngest team in the league and all that stuff. So, anyways, he he said because of my connections, I I met everybody. Relationships will always get you. You know, at some point, it'll get you somewhere. And uh, the one guy that was um, the general manager for Sarnia at the time, Sarnia Sting, said if I ever get a a, a, a job as a GM or something, he goes, I'm bringing you on board because I love your work ethic and stuff, like your ideas. He got on with. Uh, Got on with them as an assistant coach, and then he just built his way up to being a head coach. So, anyways, that was a long story. To, to I probably didn't need to get all these details, but my point of this is that he was like he he most guys would have quit hundred percent. Most guys would have quit. He, uh, um, but this guy studied the game. But here's where it got interesting for me because they play a, a very good puck possession game in Sarnia, or uh, I'm sorry, in Saginaw, and uh, to the point where it's like, I don't know if it's, I don't, I, I, sometimes I question whether it's the right thing to do or stuff, like, do you ever dump it in? So he explained his philosophy and how he trains the kids and how he treats the kids and stuff like that. So what I liked about it is, uh, uh, you know how I like to do a lot of small area games and things that are kind of outside the box, where, where you know, if you if you weren't really a hockey, well, even hockey people might look and say, ah, come on, that's a, that's a little bit goofy. Well, this guy does a lot of this stuff and he, it's called Rondo Games. So he has uh, his skill possession. What's that? Seabass. Yeah. Yeah, really good. So it's like a lot of, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen my uh, two-in, two-out game and stuff like that where you you have to make plays really quick and stuff. So then he adds that and going into, you know, entries and stuff like that and how it works into a game. And he goes, I don't like – I." I'm saying this probably wrong, but he doesn't spend as much time as you would think a normal coach would on systems. They're there, but he lets them be, be, be creative. And because of these Rondo games or these small area games, the kids kind of get it. So now he's not always, you know, there's there's times and stuff where he might give someone shit for making a, a bad play, but not typically, mm-hmm. you know. But anyways, people got to listen to the podcast. I think it's very interesting. And people that... Uh, People that are uh, in coaching, you should probably give this a listen because it's actually very, very beneficial. And I think it's uh, things that people, coaches should be doing. And I think that this guy has got a really good brain. And then the other side point is that (laughs) I was thinking about this and I go, how many people tell me that they can coach in the OHL or stuff like that? And then you listen to this guy talk for (laughs) the 35 minutes that he was talking and it's like, this guy's dialed in like yeah. you did no one puts that kind of time in like your average guy so when you think you know you don't know <laughs> yeah and it was, was great though it was great just two, my two cents on that the the puck possession thing which is cool um the, not that there's no negatives to it but the benefit of it we did an episode last two weeks ago about uh, hockey iq improving hockey iq and when a coach gives you the freedom to make plays i think that's so that's huge man where you're allowed to actually think about what to, and you're allowed to make a mistake you're allowed to make the wrong play instead of just throw it in because you didn't know what to do. And I had a, m- one of my coaches uh, when I was younger, Billy, Bill Bowler, was f- awesome at that. He would always say that. He would set up in practice. He would set up the drill, and then he would say, this is basically the routes I want you to run, but you have to make a play. Like, And then somebody would ask, well, 
what if what if this thing happens whatever he just goes you got to make a play like you don't have to do exactly this what i'm saying like these are just the paths that i'm laying out but you have to make be able to make a play you know and one of he was the first guy that that taught because i never had a coach when i was young but he was the first guy that ever taught me that tripod pass yeah yeah really yeah yeah i was like 16 when i learned this yeah he's like you cross the blue line you two on one the guy and it's real easy to make a play through his feet or through his stick or behind him or whatever to to get that guy that's cut slashing through. He was one of the first guys that ever taught me making that play as you enter the zone. And he was great for that because he lets you think about what are my options now? And you actually have to make a choice. And that's that's hockey IQ training, right? So that's just another thing for maybe more for coaches, for players too, but for coaches, when you're in positions where you have to make a decision, it's it's important to one, let your players do that. And then as the player, you're asking the question of, okay, which play should I make? Given given the options I have, like if I'm crossing the blue line with speed going into the zone, what could I do? You know, instead of thinking a lot of teams are like, you know, if if you see three jerseys, dump it in and we'll go get it or whatever. And that's like, I like that the freedom that being able to make plays and playing puck possession, it gives yeah. the players, you know. Yeah, yeah, he was good. So just to touch on that one more one more time, he was uh, saying that they, they typically don't like to dump in, but of course there's times where you do, but, but, this is where it's where it's intelligent, right? He goes, I, I I want them dumping it into where we are going to be, not too deep, like th- so we can get possession. So we know that if there's going to be a chip or you're going to lay it in there, it's going to be somewhere in the dot lane so that you mm-hmm. can you can get shots on net or make plays, not just chasing it on the wall and stuff. So interesting. Uh, the other side I wanted to say about that was uh, that changes people's view of what skill development is, right? So a lot of people, parents and coaches and players, it's like pylons and the fancy toys don't necessarily mean skill there's a lot of ways to skin a cat are they usable yes but that this this is a lot more applicable just because you don't have all the toys and it's not an exact movement you know the four on twos in the in the rondo games that he likes to play and stuff it's actually more beneficial what is skill skill is decision making skill is making plays quickly skill is uh thinking the game and um, all that kind of stuff, creating two on ones, and you're, it's just it's a it's a different version of it, which I like, and I I do a lot more. Eric Wellwood was the same thing, right? He spent a lot of time studying soccer, you know, because there's a lot of plays that are made. But basketball, looking at a basketball game, seeing picks and rolls and how things are formed, so interesting, yeah, very interesting. I really enjoyed it. I think everyone should listen to it. I know Brian, uh, they're. AGM is going to be listening to this because he listens to all our podcasts. And I, I texted him. I said, I listened to uh, Lazary on the podcast. I thought it was very good. He goes, oh, I'm going to be listening to it today. 